Good, Good morning, afternoon. everybody. Good morning. Welcome to One Million Cups Fayetteville. So glad you could come out this morning and help support entrepreneurship in our community. Glad to have everybody. We've got a great presenter today. We have Eric Hunt with business with Builders Financial Partners. He's going to come and share a little bit of information about his business. Um, and we're excited and looking forward to it. So Eric, it's all yours, take it away. So there we go, guys, we're unmuted. If can we make sure we're being heard clearly. Uh, my name is Eric Hunt. I grew up in Lumberton, North Carolina and uh, attended the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. And I currently, this, this space that I'm in is at the hub, which is a entrepreneurship incubator here as a satellite of UNC Pembroke. Just, I mean, we're literally just up the street from the main campus, but we, this is one of the most thought provoking and I don't know, there's just a real good energy here at the incubator. I'm grateful to be here grateful to be a part of One Million Cups. I, I learned about, I guess, I, I think it may, might have been a PBS show because I don't really watch much of regular TV, but I think I learned about One Million Cups uh, over a PBS special or North Carolina Public TV um, some time ago. And then I was, once I got to call to join you guys as a presenter, I was, I was ecstatic and I still am. So I, I'm a little bit about me. I am a resident of North Carolina, of course, and grew up in Lumberton, North Carolina. I spent the last six, six years in Guilford County in the Piedmont area and absolutely fell in love with that, that space, fell in love with the, the area, the energy, the people, just, just the community overall. And I, my residence was about a quarter of a mile from High Point University, which if, if any of you guys are familiar with High Point University, that's a that's there's a, that's a thriving campus to say the least they're they're growing by leaps and bounds there but with that being said the going from a totally rural um completely low income community to a community like high point that was when we got there was absolutely thriving with the furniture market and the campus community it was and and there's just so many different pieces and aspects to that community, especially the 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 entrepreneurship side of the entire triad. You have the triangle, and the triangle's known for innovations in in medical and, and te technology, and then you have the triad, and there's there's literally hands-on furniture builders. There's people who are taking their hands and and putting tools in their hands and materials in their hands. And they're creating these most, some of the most exquisite pieces of work I've seen in my life. So I don't know, being in that, being in that environment kind of sparked me to do something else with my life. I am, and we'll, we'll not get into this, but just a little bit of back, my, more about the background. As a student, I was asked to participate in, as a student pastor with, with a, with an organization, a, a faith-based organization, and I did. And at the end of that tenure, at the end of that time, I chose to move back into the entrepreneurial space because I, I kind of had a feeling that that maybe that was not the best fit for me and my family. Moving back into the entrepreneurial space, the private space, I got involved in real estate and was was looking at a market that was absolutely getting way too hot and it's way too inflated right now. I spoke to a realtor uh, this week, as a matter of fact, he bought a house this year. And when he bought the house, the house was worth $300,000. Now it is currently worth over $400,000 in the same year. That's, that's inflation that's on, that's out of control. Uh, with that being said, everyone's a skeptic as to where we're going with all this. And I say this for a reason. While, while learning the craft of, of, while going to school for, I took a course for um, real estate, I was introduced to the probability or the opportunity to get involved in insurance. And when I thought of insurance, I was thinking, man, I, who, who, 
who cares to be an insurance underwriter? Who who wants to say, you know, when I grow up, I'm going to I'm going to be an insurance guy. No one does that. That's not something we do. But it provoked me in such a way, the more I found out about it, it took me like nine months to decide that I would go down that path. And I, I finally did. It was, that's the reason I'm here now. After going down that path, making that decision, it didn't take long to get licensed. It was it was quite involved, but it wasn't hard. I won't, I'm not going to say it was hard. It was, I think it was simple. It just took commitment. Basically, like everything else we put our minds to and put our hands to, it, if, if we're committed, we can, we can see some gratification. We can see some results. So with that being said, I'm currently with an IMO out of the western part of the state over by Asheville, North Carolina called Symmetry Financial, and I work as an independent, um, independent licensed agent, but we work not as, we're not trying to promote one product or push one product onto folks. Specifically, what we're doing is looking for solutions for families and, and brokering if you will, just same as a mortgage broker, we're looking for the best deal for that individual or that family. We're looking for something that suits their portfolios, is something that makes sense to them and fits in their budget. So with that being said, I'm going to move along. I'm not going to share my PowerPoint on the screen, um, but I'm just going to go through some things here in brief to give you an idea about what we do and how we connect with folks. So the first thing I do is introduce myself and I let them know that I am a licensed agent. I provide my license number and a lot of our business, keep in mind, I am that person that loves to go to someone's house. I love to meet strangers I, we, because they're not going to be strangers long. We're going to be friends soon enough. I love to meet new people and I love to meet people face to face. Now with the restrictions that we have in place now based in, you know, for, for medical reasons, for obvious reasons, we're not doing that now so I'm having to I'm having to meet people just as we're meeting right now and that does not for some folks that's not an easy transition that's a, it may be a challenge for some of us we found it necessary and, and absolutely mandatory so we did, we did what we had to do and others it's not that important to them so we use we utilize google meets we utilize zoom and we utilize telesales, just using the telephone, having a conversation over the phone with the person on the other end, sitting down at their table, if they will, with a notepad and pen, taking notes. So here's the way I, I begin to engage my clients. And then I'll get back to the reason why I'm here as, as the presenter this morning. And again, Lori, thank you for the invitation. When I first begin speaking to the client, I'm introducing myself. They don't know me. I give them my name. I give them my license number and give them an opportunity to, to think for themselves or to, or to rationalize or, or deal within themselves. This is a piece of business that I need to take care of and I need some kind of qualifications. I need something to go on about the person I'm going to do business with. Funny thing is, Folks have been doing business with providers over the phone for decades, and it only recently became an issue because they're dealing with more local folks. They never, they never really, they never really thought twice about the commercials that were on TV. They had no idea who they who they were dealing with. And most folks, when they when they utilized that commercial, they did, they were not sure what they were purchasing or what they were getting. They still aren't. That's where I come in. So my, this, is, this is specifically called my role and purpose. My role, I'm a state licensed broker. I represent 40 plus insurance carriers. Each one is tailored to different types of people and their unique situations. Some are better suited to diabetics or high blood pressure while others are suited to younger people in perfect health. My expertise to navigate through the insurance options and narrow it down to the absolute best one for you based on your health and your budget. My purpose is to help you apply for that coverage and work with the underwriters to get it approved so we can protect your family. 
with that being said, guys, excuse me, with, with that being said, I move on into the presentation and basically just to, just to give you an idea, we're working with companies like Mutual of Omaha, we're working with Gerber, which are household names. We can, we can use, utilize those names and most people understand who those companies are. They're familiar with that name. So it kind of gives us a little bit of rapport by having those companies at access, at our access to utilize for our clients, but that's not always the best fit for, for all clients. We utilize other companies such as Forrester's Financial, which is over a hundred years old and it's a membership group. It's, it's, you're not just a client or not, you're not just a customer, you become a member of Forrester's Financial. We also have some other tools that are in place called Quility Member Services, where the members, once, once a person does business with, <clears throat> excuse me, once a person does business with an agent as my, like myself, they actually have access to other member services to help them make sure they have their entire financial portfolio taken care of, make sure all their liabilities are taken care of. And most people don't, don't really get into that. Most people don't understand what that means. So un, until you're in the business or, or unless you're in the financial sector or you're in the financial services industry, this language can be a little I've found that some some folks find it as off-putting. They think, why do you need to know my business? Well, we're working as a fiduciary. We're working here to help you make sure that you're doing what's best for you, what's best for your family. And sometimes that becomes a hurdle. So I'm going to move along and I'm trying to be mindful of time, guys. So if, I, if I'm running over or running close to the end of my time, just get, let me know. And here's what we do. This is the this is the part we start getting into the weeds a little bit with most folks. Um, and it's not so much. Let me say it like this: It's not so much. It depends on the demographic, and I'm, we're more, we're entrepreneurs here. We understand that not every demographic is exposed to good or 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 correct information when it comes to financial services or finances, period. I was not one of those persons. I had to seek it. I had, I had to, at, at a young age, I, I became an entrepreneur and I just, once I got a taste of what it meant to be an entrepreneur, I just wanted to keep running on that path. So I educated myself and, and became a non-traditional student so that I could get a proper education, if you will. So what we do is protecting life's journey. We work with accidental health, mortgage protection, term, universal, whole life, and final expense. We also work with some critical illness, long-term care, um, disability insurance. And we focus on, a, personally, I, I tend to focus, and I, I get some criticism for this, I tend to focus on, on uh, the bigger picture, and that's just the way I see life in general. I focus on a debt-free life, annuities, IULs, and and things that can kind of set people up for a comfortable retirement, or or maybe that child needs to be set up for no worries about about financial aid or no worries about the um, st student loan debt. Maybe we need to look for that child to have these pieces in place, like Olivia over here, guys. That's future entrepreneur right there uh we're we're making sure we take care of her future right and we all see that when we when we see something like that when we see the 60 year old child in the room it's obvious we've got a job to do but that can easily be forgotten so that's what we do and the part that kind of gets folks a little uneasy and i'm pretty sure you all you all could appreciate their their side of this is the needs of an analysis. We want to make sure we're doing the right thing. We're providing the right type of coverage. We're doing something that's suitable, moral, morally and ethically correct for that client. With that being said, we need some information. We can't just go blind and start throwing stuff out there and hope that something sticks. That's not the way we conduct our business. So before we talk about options, and this is this is literally the way this goes, before we talk about options, we do a needs analysis. I never want to recommend more or less protection than you might need. So I'm going to ask you some basic questions to help determine how much coverage 
we should be looking at. Does that make sense to you? And I literally give the client an opportunity to respond. I wait. I don't jump forward. I don't keep moving because they're not speaking. I wait for a response. Does that make sense to you? Because if, if that if that individual does not see how that makes sense, then maybe there's no there's nothing here to do. Maybe I should be moving on. Maybe they should be moving on. And that's, that may sound callous. It may sound coy, but honestly, we're, this is business. And if that person is not willing to see if that this makes sense, then, then we need to recognize that and, and also respect that. So basically what we do, understanding, we start asking questions about understanding concerns. And this is the part, folks, and I'm going to tell on myself here. I was raised in a parsonage and I was I was raised to believe that everyone is intrinsic intrinsically good. Um, we we would like to believe that, right? Um, I, but the reality is <laughs> maybe that's not necessarily the case always. Um, so understanding your concerns and we we try to ask questions that are not going to be too off putting, but we we still need to get to the answers we need answers and facts in order to determine need in order to determine the correct fit so the question number one that i would ask the client is what is your main concern in terms of putting this protection in place for your family and a lot of us have we do have main concerns i i have my six-year-old daughter is right here over my shoulder she's right behind me here in the office and that's a main concern my wife is a main concern i have other children that are a main concern the question number two, if your spouse were to pass away, what would that situation look like from a financial standpoint? And that's where we start. The main concern is easy for folks to answer. But when we start asking questions to get a little bit more deeper into their business, what the, if, if my wife were to pass away today, where would that put me financially? I need These are questions we need to tackle. We need to deal with these questions because there's a future coming. And in that future, at some point, there's going to be one of us. There's not going to be two of us. And we need to plan for the one. No matter which one it is, we need, we need to plan for that one. So question number three is, would you want to stay in your home or move? I mean, downsizing sounds great, but it, it, it's, it's a challenge. It's a job. It's a, real, it's a true chore to downsize because then you you may have to liquidate or give away or donate or do something you you there's chances are there's a whole lot of work going to be involved in downsizing <clears throat> the subsequent questions to number three are these two questions if you want to stay in your home can you afford to if you want to move where would you go rent move in with family buy another buy another home so when we start getting into that conversation, that's where things get difficult for most of our clients. They, they tend to, like most of us, we want to start putting up walls and barriers at that point. So with that being said, I'm getting back to the presentation here. And specifically, I'm going back to the, the one, million cup, 1 Million Cups um, invitation and here's who we are specifically. That's the IMO, that's the spreadsheet. That's what I utilize to speak with clients. That's not it in its entirety because time will not allow, but understanding where we're going and the conversation, the dialogue that we're entering in. I wanna give you a little bit understanding of me and then I'll give you the questions that, that I would lo love to have some feedback from you guys. And if I'm going too quick here, just slow me down. But the company description, you can find it on One Million Cups website with Builders Financial Partners. Builders Financial Partners is an independent financial services agency superior to the one-size-fits-all approach. We leverage plans designed by more than 30 A-rated providers to secure client assets and protect our clients' financial futures. Here's the problem. That, that we're facing. Describe the problem your business is solving 
so this is the problem we're solving for our clients. We work with clients and providers to solve the problem of facing the future without adequate safe asset growth, living benefits, and death benefits. Our client's base is made up predominantly of middle-income America. Over the last 18 months, we have focused on focused our attention on product knowledge, client relations, product production, and survival. As entrepreneurs here, guys, survival is is paramount, right? A lot of us don't make it after the, the first two years, and that's just the, that's just the nature of being an entrepreneur. You have, kind of have to pay your dues. Our client base is made up predominantly of middle income America. Over the last 18 months, we have focused on focused our attention on production knowledge, on product knowledge, client relations, production, and survival. We recently partnered with Symmetry Financial Group so that over over the next 18 months, we will build a team of writing agents while growing our client base. The questions that we're we're presented with are these. Number one, it says, please answer the following questions. Number one, share one to two wild statements about your business. Number The number one answer that I gave was we have successfully found many allocations for safe money growth while providing a guaranteed income. And what does that mean? That was a brief statement, but what that means in, in short is I have a client who's 79 who had suffered a heart attack and had recently purchased a home at 79 years old. And there was a reason for that. That was a lot of people say, why would you do that? She had a good reason to do that. Um, it was her money and it was, she, she knew what she was doing. So with that being said, she was looking for mortgage protection at her, at her age and having an open heart surgery, that was not going to be the case. So after several weeks of, of looking at her situation and, and searching to find out what was the best solution for her. And this is one of those cases, guys, where she totally stonewalled me for, for two weeks about her finances, not knowing I, I'm, she just simply had to, she, she had to get to the point to where she knew she could trust me. She had to know that when she called me, I would answer the phone. She had to, she had to get to that point. And when she did, we were totally able to help her. But prior to her opening up, we were, we were at a stalemate. We were stuck. We, she had the assets, but we, based on the information she was giving us, Initially, we were not able to prove that the solution that we had was suitable for her. And that was a huge disappointment for me because I totally knew that we could do something great for this lady. And in just a moment, I'll tell you what we are, were able to do. So we were providing guaranteed income and asset growth for this particular client. I got a call from someone who had been in the business for 40 years, the advanced market business. And when we say advanced markets, we're talking about um, IRAs, IULs, 401ks, annuities. I specifically work in, in guaranteed products. I do not work in variable products at all. Uh, I'm not licensed to work with those products and, and do not care to. I just, I would prefer to stay away from risk. So when speaking with this particular client, her money was in a product, it was in an IRA and her capital was going down, her, her premium was going away because she was utilizing this money as income to pay the mortgage that she had just taken out, this new home that she had purchased. This, this product was literally paying her mortgage. But the way we found, the way we were looking at things, the, the math told us that she was going to run out of money in just a few years, and her, and then she was going to be stuck trying to figure out what to do with, with this home, and she had no intentions of going anywhere. Well, long story short, she finally opened up. We were able to make this case of suitability, and in her particular case, we took her $255,000 that, that was intended for her retirement, for her 
guaranteed income. We took that $255,000 and immediately were able to turn the 255 into 270 from day one. And she's guaranteed income for life for the rest of her life on a month by month basis from that, from that money. She'll never have to worry about that mortgage being paid. It's paid. Her beneficiary will receive the balance of that account. And that's, that's already been set up and arranged. So when we talk about wild statements, I'm very proud of that one. In another instance, I was able to help a couple who had quite a bit of money sitting in a CD. They moved the money from the CD to another product. And this, again, this is an annuity. And they were able to take their, I think they were at the time they were getting like 1% on their money. We moved it to a product where their money was guaranteed to get a 1%, but over the past year, they performed at 9.5. So those are, those are two wild statements. You want to talk about happy? We've got happy clients. We've got friends for life. And I sleep good at night knowing that that money is safe. So what part of our presentation, of your presentation, do you feel needs the most improvement? For me, getting in front of clients to show the value of these products, we typically see clients one-on-one -on -one and of course, of course, we're doing this through Zoom and most of my clients, for some reason, the Zoom or the group me or the telephone, they struggle. This generation is, is gonna be 55 and older. And this, this generation is, is my favorite generation. I feel like, I was, I'm, I'm like I'm like a decade behind my favorite folks because this generation remembers how to connect with each other. This generation, is able to put down technology and pick up a, a book. This generation actually writes a letter and puts it in the mail and sends it off to someone every once in a while. They, they, still, they still hand write their cards to friends and family on special occasions. That generation I absolutely love. I absolutely love. And this is something that, that I struggle with, with, with watching this happen. So with my my love for this 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 group this generation how do i convey where i am as an entrepreneur what it is that i'm providing as an entrepreneur how do i convey that to a generation that appreciates hands on face to face the, there there's a more uh how can we say it? a more or more of an organic engagement with this generation versus folks like my myself and my wife we're we're kind of in between two generations where the one after us has they do not they do not see the value of this personal face to face they they can go along without ever meeting anybody and and that's the i mean that's their life that's the way they live but how do i convey that to that generation? How do I get the message across to that generation utilizing technology? That's one of my biggest struggles. So getting in front- I've got, a couple, I've Go got ahead. a couple of questions, Eric. So Go ahead. will you tell us exactly who your target market is and how are you generating those leads? Yeah, absolute great question. My target market typically my target market is going to be someone who has someone who qualifies for a mortgage or someone who's a homeowner, someone who has a pension plan, someone who has a 401k, someone who has an IRA mutual fund, someone who believes in investments. They're already convinced that investments are the way to go. I don't know. Maybe you guys have seen this book. We're, we're looking at the investor, the, the, the self-employed, the employed, the self-employed, and business owner and investor. What we're looking for, my, my client is going to be that person who, honestly, who appreciates being in a stable environment, appreciates... Um, most of them are going to be are going to have some type of education beyond high school. It's not mandatory, but it is 
it is a typical client. Um, <clears throat> someone that generate. How are you generating leads, though, Eric? The leads. I'm, the, I'm confused because I have a I have a home telephone number that I've had for decades, but no one ever answers it because mostly um, anyone that's calling it's about my auto warranty that's been expired. So how are you generating <laughs> leads when you're talking about telesales? Um, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna share something with you, and this is this is one of my clients. Um, Give me just a second here because there's there's some information I need to hold on just a second, guys. I'm gonna our our leads are generated like this, and I will show you right now how how they're generated. This person who I'm gonna show you, they okay, there we go. So this is going to be backwards because of my camera or whatnot, but this is this is a typical lead. These mailers go out and the individual fills this mailer out and with their own pen and they mail it back in for information. And here's what it says. This is this is the typical lead. This is, you may qualify for a state regulated program to pay for your final expense. This is one of the, I typically don't do these, but this is a typical lead and that person will fill this out and ask for information and I'll, I'll get the information to that person. It's a direct request for information. On the flip side, give me just one second guys. With, this, with that same thing being said, we also have mortgage protection. And this is when folks apply for a mortgage or when they get approved for the mortgage, it generates that action itself generates a lead. That person can then, or it, it may generate a lead. Let me say it that way. But that person can also receive a flyer in the mail, a card in the mail, and just simply fill it out and send it back in to us and we will follow up on the information they're asking for. And I'm about to, okay. Your, here's, a, here's another one that's filled, filled out by the, they, they put their own information here. They're requesting the information. And you, you are entitled to participate in our low cost mortgage protection life insurance program, which can protect your loan in the case of unexpected tragedy. It also speaks about the death benefit, the disability, the unemployment, and the money back option, which would be a return of premium, something like that, or an investment product that after so many years, that investment product will literally uh, replace the money they've spent for the protection. So is, does that help answer your question, Lori? It does somewhat, Eric, and I'm still curious about, I have a couple of questions. So Go ahead. How, how, you're a broker, so what is, what is your revenue stream look like? Where's your revenues coming from? Here's, here's the way this works. Um, first of all, there, we also have online clients that they will go online and look for information. They'll, they'll specifically ask for us to reach back out to them. Our revenue stream is, is, is works like this. I have several companies, um, like we said, Mutual of Omaha, Gerber, Forrester's Financial, uh, Americo, American Amicable, American Equity, Fidelity and Guarantee, several companies we work with. And what we're able to do is bring, this is, this, this is the place where these companies struggle. Their biggest struggle is to get in front of a client. Their biggest struggle is to engage that client. And that's where we come in as field underwriters, as brokers. That's our specialty. That's just what I just read to you a moment ago about our, our role and purpose is to engage that client one-on-one -on -one and make sure we're able to give them an option or a solution that best that makes the best sense to them and fits in their budget based on their health and age. 
what we're able to do then, and this is exactly how it works. If I were to just say Lori, for instance, if it were you and I having this conversation us and, and Lori decided, okay, this makes sense to me. I think this, this is a good fit for my family or for me. Um, what next? I said, well, the next step is to fill out the application to see if we can get you approved. To make sure we want, don't want to put the cart before the horse. So we fill out the application and most of the applications are done, on, almost all of them are done online now with DocuSign. So I could fill out the application on my side, you could fill out the application on your side and through DocuSign, we could get everything done and you would have your copy, I would have my copy and I would forward my copy to the provider. Say for instance, in the case of, of Forrester's Financial. Well, what we would do then is Forrester's Financial, I'm as a field underwriter, I'm, I'm signing an affidavit saying that the information we're submitting is as accurate and, and true to my knowledge as, as, as we could get. They verify the information we're submitting. They actually have access to your MIB to find out, you know, is, or is the medical information we're submitting correct, making sure all, the, all of the information is correct, verifying all of the information on the application. And once upon approval, which depending on the product, it could take hours, it could take a few days, it, typically within the week, the approval is, is made, the decision is made. At the time that the approval is made, then the initial premium is paid so that the coverage is in, in, it is in effect at that point. And once the coverage is in effect, the company pays me, it's more or less like a finder's fee. We get, it's called a commission, but most brokers, most of your, there's a lot of folks who, let me, I'm trying to be careful how I use my words here. Most folks are paid on every single transaction. If they do a piece of business for someone, they get paid every transaction. That's not the way it works here. We get paid a percentage up front. And then if that person keeps the coverage, if we if we keep that client, then after the first year, we'll receive like residual income for keeping that client, making sure that client is being serviced, making sure that client's being taken care of, touching base and following up with that client. So with that being said, we get initial income up front and then on a quarterly basis, year after year, we get additional income for, for taking care of that client. That's at that point, you would, you'd be my client. We just, I mean, we're going to talk at least once a quarter. We're going to check in and see if there's anything going on with you at least once a quarter. And if it, something does happen with you, your family's going to know, call Eric. He he has her he has access to her policy. He has access to her to her living benefits. Let's call him first to see what we can do for for Lori. And that's that's the way that's gonna work. I and I'm the person who would literally help get those benefits to you or your family, whatever the case may be. But that's how our income stream works. Our income stream works as is commission based. So we're based, we're, and again, we're not operating in securities. We're not operating in variable products. Um, we are dealing with safe money products. We're dealing with guaranteed products. So any more questions? Anyone else have questions? I have one. How are you setting yourself apart from other people who do what you do? How do I set myself apart from... That's an excellent question. And here's, initially, this is what I'm going to do. Cindy, if, if you and I are speaking about trying to, trying to help you get into the best safe situation you should be in, say, for the next 10 years, I like to look at what's been going on the last 10 years. What's hap what, what would you like to see happen the next 10 years? So by that conversation, we're, we're building a relationship. I have a phone, I have my contact list is full right now of clients and they, they'll call me just out the blue just to speak because I really do try to, maybe it's, maybe it's because of being raised in the parsonage, maybe it's because of being serving as a student pastor, but I, I see myself as a servant 
helping someone. I've committed to helping this person. I've committed to being a, a part of this person's future. So what we're going to do is keep this dialogue going. And I'm, I'm just going to pick up the phone every once in a while and just, hey, how you doing? We're not talking business. We're just, I just want to see if you're, are you well? I just want to know what's going on with you. Did, did that child graduate or, or, you know, did the, did the wedding take place or did they call everything off? You know, stuff like that. The way I set myself apart is through dialogue, honestly. Um, most of my clients, they, they knew her, who their agent was on day one and five years later, they've not heard from that person again. So I, I really love dialogue. My wife tells me, she says, you've never met a stranger. How do you do that? We're all neighbors. We're on one rock, y'all. I mean, good grief. It is, we we want to divide ourselves based on labels and lines and all that. I don't see those divisions. I see you and I see me. And if we don't get along, fine. If if we do get along, fine. That's, so how do I set myself apart? is basically through service. I, and I utilize, and I'm, I thought about this question early this morning, by the way, I utilize carriers that if, if I answer the phone, I mean, if I pick up the phone and I call this carrier and they're readily answering that phone, that's the person I'm going to take your business to. That's the company I'm going to take your business to. If I go to a company and I've got to wait 30 minutes to get on the phone with them, I'm not going to, I'm not going to suggest that you deal with that company. It's, and more often than not, I find a lot of these companies, you will never hear from them. You'll have to wait 30 minutes or longer to just to get someone on the line. I don't, I prefer not to deal with folks like that. So it sounds like you're giving personal service, personal relationship. You can count on me, I'll be there. So um, unfortunately, a lot of us have experience where the sales pitch is good. We go with the product, and like you said, you never hear from the person again. You try a call yeah. and get no no response or whatever. And I know my sister is going through that right now, where they're chasing a guy for six months who won't return a call. So if I have never, if I've never had a relationship with you before, how are you going to communicate that to me that you're going to be there for me? You're going to provide that personal service. You're going to be available. I mean, how are you going to communicate that to me as a potential new customer? Well, if I was if I was the agent that your 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 sister cannot get in contact with, I would be nervous because that you you may report me to the insurance commissioner. There is an accountability aspect to this to this business. Most folks do not utilize it, and a lot of folks in my that are sitting in my position take advantage of that. But at some point, the tables will turn, right? So, what I do is I, if I'm speaking to Cindy for the first time, just like today, and we were we were conducting this interview that I just start I started the actual interview process with 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 Lori. I went through the I went through the PowerPoint that I utilized. So Cindy, how do I how do I articulate that I'm going to be there for you? First of all, I've, I'm building a legacy for my family. If I handle my business correctly, I get to pass my business to her. The more business I have to give her the better off she's going to be financially. And I don't mind sharing my story. I'll, I'll share PowerPoint slides showing who my family is, who I am. I don't, I don't mind sharing that with my clients. I'll tell them my story. The, the reason I actually considered getting into the insurance business was that in 2014, I had just taken a, a, um, an exam and was getting ready to submit my final paper for one of the courses here at UNCP. And on December the 8th, 2014, I, that was an awesome day, awesome day. And before the day was over, I was in the back of an uh, ambulance and I was in the hospital for the next three days. So what I'm trying to do is I, I'm trying to communicate to you that I'm a real person. I'm not some, I'm not some fly by night. 
I'm literally trying to build something for my family here as well as be a good neighbor. You say, well, you're not just being a neighbor, you're getting commissions off of this. Duh, we've got to support our family somehow. If you teach, you get a teacher's wage. If you preach, you get a preacher, preacher's wage. If you un write insurance, you get the, the insurance underwriter's commission. That's, that's just the way things work. We have to have these financial benefits in place. So with Cindy, basically, it's just going to be, long story short, it's just going to be open dialogue. And you're, I have one phone. There's no fake phone numbers. There's none of that stuff. I don't, I, I know that in this industry, there's a lot of that stuff happening. Um, if I'll tell folks, look me up, call my phone, go on my website. And I think, I think that's what I'm trying to um, impress upon you. Um, there are so many times, like Lori said, now where people call us with that um extended car warranty stuff and all that that we look at our phone if we don't know that phone number, we don't know that person i don't even answer the phone because you know right. i don't want to get that person again and storytelling is very powerful and we absolutely um advocate that in one million cups because the power of the story is just is just really there but you're going to need to find a way to get that dialogue started because yes. cold calls scare me and you're just going to need to to find a way to share part of your story or get that attraction of those right clients will answer your call when you call this part of what i do is i i call on a regular basis i i, I don't call sporadically if someone fills out one of these cards they're expecting a phone call if I call that person four times and they've not picked up the phone, I'm going to leave a message and, and tell them my name, my number, why I'm calling, and what it's in reference to. And I'll leave a message maybe twice. And if if I don't hear from that person, if a lot of times I'll actually drive by the house and say, hey, guys, we got this card in our office that you had filled out. Um, we just want to set a time to go over the information. We don't have to do this face to face, but I just need to get this information out to you. And I love, I actually love doing that. I love knocking on a stranger's door and saying, Hey, this, this, I'm the person who got your request. How can I help? But I, I love it. I'm, I've always, I, my mom's a teacher. My, my dad's a minister and it's, it's, my wife's a medical professional. We, that's all we do is love people. Also, what we do is we spend our entire life loving people. So I appreciate what you're saying. One other thing that I've thought about in response to what you're saying, and there was a question I saw just popped up on the screen and I'll address that question in just a second. One of the ways that I, I address this is simply drop one of my business cards and send it to the, the person that's not answering the phone a handwritten note this is who i am this is what i'm doing i don't use co copy and paste i hand write notes and i'm not the <laughs> i'm not the best Eng english student guys so there's some self -dep deprivation going on in some of these letters and it's okay it just lets them know that i'm a real person i don't i mean you know it's, I'm, I'm not trying to put on airs for anyone i'm just i'm just trying to share the information so that the question that we had here in the chat. It was Catherine. Uh, Catherine, are you still available? Can you hear me? Okay. Is there a certain income level needed for your services? That is awesome, awesome question. Basically, it's it's not how much money you have coming in. It's how much money you save. It's it's we're we're typically. If someone is struggling to keep their pay, struggling to pay for their medications and struggling to pay for their, you know, keep their lights on, stuff like that, we might not be able to help that person because of that financial struggle. But if that person has, if there's a way that the that the budget can accommodate, uh, say, an accidental death plan, we can put an accidental death plan in place for less than twenty bucks. So if for someone who has nothing, that's accidental death is something and it's they and it's something that could help a family in the event that 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 loved one 
something happened to them. Uh, we are also able for less than $100 a month, we're typically able to put in some kind of permanent coverage, depending on the health, depending on the age, we're able to put in some kind of permanent coverage to, to at least take care of six months of mortgage payments or final expense, you know, something along those lines. Now, if we're talking about building wealth or, or a safe place to put money, if, if the, the minimum for those products is $5,000, and that's, that's it's typically a $5,000 initial premium, and those premiums receive a bonus anywhere from 7% to 25% based on the particular product that we're utilizing. I saw some eyebrows go up. I, yeah, I said, <laughs> <laughs> I did say so that. So Eric, you mentioned saving and I, I teach business and entrepreneurship here at Fayetteville Tech. And so, yes. um, you know, I tell my students all the time, a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. Start yes. saving today. How yes. do you overcome um, challenges related to that idea? How do you get people to buy into that principle? I, I'm not going to start plundering. You almost... <laughs> <laughs> I actually do very rude. I, I, I love to draw. I love visuals. And I actually do rude and crude. Let's, let's do this. You ready? Can I take this? How many minutes do I have? Like two, three? Oh, you're muted. We have just a couple minutes left. So, uh... so let, me, let me share this with you right quick. I'm going to do a quick screen share. I said I was. There, there we go. So, oh. well, I was looking for my whiteboard. Nope. I can't find the whiteboard, guys. There we go. Okay, can you see my whiteboard? Are you guys there? Yes, we can see it. Okay, here we go. This is your, I'm just gonna give you the stock market from January of, uh, or December of 19 to present. Basically, uh, here we go. No, no, no. Well, there we go. Now, so the market in January. This is this is January nineteen. This is the beginning. This is now. We're just doing a rude and crude. This is now. So we, we get over that hurdle of the folks, some folks want to live for today and for today only. And honestly, those folks are not going to be our clients in, in, unless there's some, we do have to manage expectations as well as behaviors. Would you agree to that, Lori? So in January, our market is doing like this and we come along we're going through the year and all of a sudden, bam. So we, we pick up a little bit of pace. We do a little bit of recovery. We have impulse correction and we have continuation and we have that going on until now. And you see it starts to flatten out here lately. This is just overall market. Well, in the products that I'm sharing with you guys right now, I have a client that came, got into the, this was April 1, 2020 right here. This client came into the market here. They rode that high. They're in a, they're in a guaranteed product. So they're not going to lose their product comes here, goes here, here and riding on out. So this is where they entered the market. And this was with an 
what we call a fear. A fixed indexed annuity. Now, with that being said, I just showed you how that money could grow. Okay, you think that that's great, but I'm not qu quite understanding. Well, again, let's go back to your dollar. This is this is your dollar right here. Here's the pie that you're trying to participate in with your dollar. You join one of these companies and now instead of participating in your own little budget, now you're participating in something that's got several zeros behind it. So how do we convince folks to, to invest well if you only invest in your own in yourself this is your slice of the pie that's that's it if you take that same investment and put it with some put it with a group put it with a plan that's that's stronger than you are by yourself now here's your slice of the pie That's how that's how these companies can offer seven to twenty five percent Does that make sense to you guys? Let's get back over here. Yes, it does. You're muted, Lori. Eric, we're almost out of time. Um, we really thank you for coming and, and spending some time with us this morning. I'm going to take the last question. Um, what can this community do for you? How can we help you and that's, your business? Right. There's That's the one I've been waiting on <laughs> this entire time. Guys, I'm right now I I utilize leads and the leads are part of my overhead and it's it's an acceptable part of the overhead at this point. What I'm needing from this community at this point is honestly this. How can what thoughts, what experiences, what contributions could you make? as members of a community and what criticisms could you give as, mem as members of this community to help me to get in front of more people in a place where they are comfortable? If they're not comfortable with Zoom, if they're not comfortable with group, with, with a Google Meets or something like that, how do I get into a place given our current environment and risks and, and everything associated with it how do how can I address multiple people at once and address their questions at once in one place? How is that possible? Do you have any advice or any suggestions? Well, I'm gonna one, jump in. I'm gonna jump in first. And say, um, have you thought about going to local organizations or like churches and stuff? And instead of going to sell, you're going to present some information yep. on some topics to help them. Yeah. Like you might go to a church group where they're um seniors not necessarily senior citizens but you know they're adult groups and just doing like a a little talk on um what are the different types of investments or how can you start saving today for a young group or something yep. and they get to know you and at the end you can say well if you'd like some more information you know, here's my card or or whatever the case may be so you're not coming yes. at it from a um sales point of view necessarily because some groups will run far and quick if they know you're coming to sell something i know i would because <laughs> um, you do have the proverbial um stereotype of you know insurance agents we run as quickly as we can because you know you will um talk us to death or or we won't be able to escape you so you have to get around that 
So you probably get around that is to go and tell them in advance, talk to the people, say, what is it you're looking for? Is it your youth group who needs to learn how to start saving or young adults, excuse me, young adults have to start saving early on to your adult groups who need to know. Um, one of the popular ones we, we did that drew quite a few attention was um, how to start if you're a small investor, how to get started. How to get started. And yeah. when you build those relationships early, and they, they feel like they can trust you because you're not out to sell them. You know, you're just providing information, but you're establishing that relationship that you like. And you could get even a, hey, if you want more information, you know, just leave me your, your you know, have, have a sign-in sheet or something, something, something where they can um, sign up for more information. But you're taking the pressure off of them at first. So then they're just opening to listening to you as opposed to listening that with that, that little trigger in your head that says you're trying to sell me something that you mentioned earlier. Yes. Yep. So you, you take the pressure off, you take the stress off. I can listen to you. You start building that relationship that you talked about. That's so important that you like, which I, I do like, and you gain their confidence and then they're more likely to follow up with you. That's one suggestion I have. And thank you, Cindy, that, that approach is called a seminar approach. And uh, the the one thing that I did not want to do is go into that without getting some feedback from enough folks who would actually be open to it first is there's a lot of people who have burned a seminar crowd. Uh, so my, my second piece of advice is don't call the seminar. <laughs> yes. You're absolutely right. You are absolutely yeah. right. That seminar is just a sneaky way of saying you're coming and I'm going to give you a free meal or whatever and I'm going to put the bite on you. No, right. that's what I'm saying. Approach groups like church groups or community groups, um, that kind of thing. And you take the sales hat off for a, a moment, establish yes. that relationship, and then they can come to you or you can right. contact them afterwards. But you got to take the salesperson approach out or else. And seminar, we've gotten used to that. Here, come for a free meal at this steakhouse. <laughs> but you can put the fight on me. So, no, thank you. That's yeah. the Eric, yes. I have to say the approach of calling people, that's a, a means of generating leads. I, I don't think that is going to totally work. I, I just think um, no. things change, people change, and they continue to evolve. So we have to adapt to that, right? Yes. Um, if you were targeting my mother, um, I can tell you now Zoom's not going to be um, a way to capture that that demographic. Yes. It's just not going to work. Um, today we're turning to social media. Um, I, you know, I would definitely, um, you know, we have several um, social media gurus here on campus. The Small Business Center on campus. We have a small business center here. I would encourage you to utilize that. Um, definitely some sort of social media presence is going to be, um, essential, I feel like. Um, and so, um, of course, a website with testimonials is going to be important. Um, but I would encourage you to reach out to the Small Business Center, um, see if they could direct you toward a, a social media, um, person that could definitely, um, make an impact on your business. What a, so what I'm the way I'm processing listening to Cindy and listening to Lori here, I'm actually I'm one step ahead. <laughs> it, I mean, and I thank you guys for your input because now I feel a whole lot better about an investment that I've made is we are actually working on a professional social media site that is done by a marketing, not by me, because I'm not I'm not that person. We're not all good at everything. And as entrepreneurs, you're not supposed to be. So right. you have to reach out to those, to to add members of a team that are going to benefit your business. Um, right. So I would definitely um, suggest that, especially if you're not good at social media and many of us aren't. Um, so definitely find someone that is. Um, so I think that's very important. And also, you know, directing them to your website. Um, if you have testimonials there where someone can say, 
exactly um, the benefits of using your business. Um, that would help as well. That was the suggestion just came across the screen to utilize um, utilize Facebook Live and do a do a thing once a week for less than ten minutes. Get the video reviews from clients and share those on social media and your website. Vlogging is popular now. Yeah, exactly. This now, this is the type of feedback that I I love this stuff. I actually do like writing and generating content. I I look I, as I enjoy writing. I've just not applied it to my business as of yet. And part of that is making sure that I have an ear for the clientele before I start putting. I mean, you can write all you want to. And if you're not addressing concerns, just like what you got, the advice you guys are giving, this stuff is golden. So if I'm not addressing the concerns and utilizing the advice, then producing content's just another noise in the air. Uh, so I, I really do appreciate it. It sounds like we could utilize social media to, to do what most folks were calling a seminar. And I, I, I man, that's a sad, yeah. And, Thanks, and Eric, we've, we, we've all heard the, the old adages, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And there may be some truth to that. So network, network, network. Yes. Um, we're, we're out of time. And so what I want to do is invite you back as part of our audience. We meet um, every Wednesday. Um, we're going to be okay. on Zoom for a little while till we figure out what COVID's going to do. And even right. once we return face to face, we're right here at Fable Tech. If you're in the neighborhood, stop by. If not, we're going to have some sort of hybrid session where we can still have that Zoom um, right. component. Um, you never know who is going to be in the audience. So we definitely would invite you to come back. Would love to have you. Um, it was a pleasure having you today. Um, again, thanks so much for coming and presenting. Great job. Um, I will say that we're not going to meet next week. Um, classes on campus um, will resume soon. And so many of us are, are in, a, in the midst of um, chaos, if you will. I'm trying to get all the, the loose ends tied up um, in the height of registration and, and that sort of thing. But we will resume the 18th and we would love to have you come back, Eric. Um, okay, you have all my information. Um, Cindy Burns is the Dean of the Business Programs here at Fayetteville Tech. She's also a One Million Cups organizer. Um, we would love to have you come back. So thanks so much. Um, take care and again, we have a small business center here on campus that might be of some assistance and could provide you some great ideas. Athena actually works there. So I would encourage you to, to reach out to them as well. Thank you so much, guys. All right, this Eric. Was, this was a pleasure. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. Again, we won't meet next week, but we will resume um, back to a weekly basis on the 18th. So see everybody then. Have a great day. Thank you. Take care.